Hey, welcome back to Gold's Garage. So we got David Bougie's engine hanging on the hook on the way to the dyno, but it's going to make one stop. It's going to go to see my buddy Tom Winkler. And Tom is a perfectionist. That's why I'm going to have him do that. Uh, David bought this nice log manifold to go on the carburetor uh, like that. And Tom is going to fabricate a solid steel, solid fuel line from the fuel pump uh, to the carburetor. Now, we don't use any of that on the dyno, but uh, David wanted, as opposed to a flexible hose or something, a solid line, and Tom's the guy to do that. He's a perfectionist. So uh, we will probably make a video from Tom's place. He has the nicest 56 Chev resto mod truck I've ever seen in my life, so we'll get give you a chance to see that. So the point of that video is, there are a lot of myths in the engine building community, and I said before, uh, eventually I'm going to get to them all and dress them all. So something's going on on YouTube right now that's kind of prompting me to do that. Uh, there is a debate going on uh, between um, more than two now, actually, YouTube channels that uh, one advocates that if you knurl a piston, it creates less friction and therefore frees up horsepower and it's a well-kept secret to win races. And the other side of that argument is uh, it's an obsolete method that was used years ago, back in the day, so to speak, to salvage old pistons that should have been replaced and should never be used on a modern engine. So there's lots of controversy going on. And I'm not going to get involved in controversy. I deal in facts. I deal in physics. So uh, the guys that designed these engines were engineers. They used sound engineering principles. They applied them in theory, developed the design, and then they validated that design by empirical testing. So what is empirical testing? Empirical testing is this physical, real-life testing that you can measure your results and either validate your theory or uh, find out if it's not right. So let me give you a quick example. You build an engine, and most guys do this before you build it. You calculate the compression ratio and the cranking pressure PSI of it, and you assemble it, you start it up, and then you do a compression check uh, to determine what the actual PSI of compression is. And so that compression check is empirical testing. Going, putting the engine on the dyno and measuring torque and horsepower. We've calculated and estimated how much horsepower this engine is going to make based on models and, and sound engineering principles. And this Saturday, we're going to the dyno and we're going to measure using empirical testing. We're going to measure the actual torque and horsepower. That is real life. The theory doesn't mean anything, and you, unless you can prove it by empirical testing, you're basically, uh, you know, just guessing. So that's the point of it. So, uh, so back to the purpose at hand. The the principle uh, is of those who advocate that a, a neural piston creates less friction is because when you neural it, you reduce the amount of surface of the piston that's going to uh, rub against or slide against the cylinder wall because of this, the process of knurling. And I'll put a picture of a knurled piston up there if you're not familiar with it. Uh, you can see for yourself what that means. So that concept means that if there's less area of contact, that means there's going to be less friction. So I'm going to give you some real life examples of uh, how you can do some empirical testing yourself. You can calculate it yourself. And so, starting with, first of all, the formula for friction from the Machinery's Handbook, the Bible for Engineers. So, that's physics, guys. I don't make up the stuff, and it's not negotiable. Uh, that's just what it is. So, the formula for friction is equal to mu, and mu is just a Greek letter that they use for the coefficient of friction times n. So n is just the normal force between the two surfaces. If, if it weighs 100 pounds and it's sitting square on a 
sliding surface, then the normal force is 100 pounds. So that arrow down is 100 pounds. That's the end. In the mu, there is a unique coefficient of friction for any two surfaces that rub together or slide together. And so, just to point out, the coefficient of friction for static friction is different than sliding friction. And a good application of that is if you torque a bolt uh, using sliding friction when you're torquing it, and you try to untorque it, now you've got static friction, it'll take more torque to loosen it than it took to tighten it. That's the difference between static friction uh, and sliding friction. So, in the case of a piston rubbing on a cylinder wall, you have lubricated sliding friction, okay? So, between two surfaces. So, because oil is uh, being splashed up on the cylinder wall and create a lubricant between the, the piston and the cylinder wall. So, so we're going to use an example, and so I want to differentiate, differentiate also the difference between force and pressure. So, the weight of the, I'm assuming it's 100 pounds, it doesn't matter what it is, but as long as we use the same weight in this example as we use in this example, then it's the same, and as long as we use the same coefficient of friction, uh, it's going to make my point. So, force is in pounds, and pressure is in pounds per square inch. And we're going to differentiate that, and it's important to remember that as I go forward. So, if we have a 100-pound weight, so a 100-pound normal force between these two sliding surfaces, Okay, and we apply, I'm going to use a coefficient of friction of 0.15. There's a unique coefficient of friction for every two surfaces. Uh, you can look it up yourself, and you have to differentiate once again, is it static or, or, or sliding, and is it dry or lubricated? So, I'm using 0.15 in this case, and once again, I'm going to use 1.15 in both examples, so it doesn't really matter, I just want to make the point. So if we have a force of 100 pounds pressing down because of the weight between these two sliding surfaces, and we multiply, that's the force, that's the end, that's the 100 pounds, times the coefficient, that's the coefficient, 0.15. 100 times 0.15 is 15 pounds of force. So it takes 15 pounds of force to slide a 100 pound weight over that surface if the coefficient of friction is uh, once again, 0.15. So, I made the weight uh, the irregular, not square, for a purpose. Now, if you take that same weight, okay, whatever it is, block of steel or lead or whatever, doesn't matter, and you turn it 90 degrees, and now you have this surface in contact. So, in the first case, you only have two square inches of contact between the two surfaces. So, now you have four square inches of surface in contact. So, keep that in mind when you're thinking about a piston that's knurled versus not knurled, where in one case you have less area of surface contact uh, than the other. So, now we take the same 100 pound weight, we apply the same force, the coefficient of friction is the same, the normal force is still 100 pounds, 100 times 0.15, it's still 15 pounds. What's the takeaway from that? The takeaway from that is the area of contact is not a factor, okay, uh, in the formula, and it doesn't matter what the area of contact is. So, when I say that, you're going to say, well, okay, now, thinner piston rings have a small area of contact. Uh, they reduce friction. They free up horsepower. How does that work? Well, I got an answer for that, too. So, let's go to page two. By the way, I forgot to mention, you know, whenever I have to do something like this, right on a whiteboard or whatever, I envy Brian Salter. He stands up there with his uh, Sharpie on his whiteboard, and he draws freehand, and he just does an awesome job. I just don't have the ability to do that, so I do it all in advance. So, anyway, back to the example we're using. So, how does this apply to narrow piston rings, and why do they free up horsepower Reduce friction and free up horsepower. Here's why. So let's take the first side, uh, example, and we're going to use all the rest of the factors still the same. So that is 
the standard cast iron piston ring, if you buy a economy cast iron piston ring, it's 564 thick. That's 078, 78,007 inch. And so that's the piston ring. That is the cylinder wall, so the piston ring is sliding up against. So that's the sliding surface between them. So first of all, you need to know uh, the contact area. So the contact area is 078, the thickness, times 4 inches, which is the bore of the cylinder, times pi, which is 3.14. You got 0.98 square inches of contact area in the whole circle of the ring against the cylinder wall. Okay. So the PSI, the pounds per square inch, is equal to, uh, you got, okay, back here, 10 pounds. Let's assume there's 10 pounds of surface force pushing that ring against the cylinder wall, 10 pounds back here. That's tension. So 10 pounds divided by 0.98, you got 10.2 PSI of surface contact pressure, pressure pounds per square inch between the two surfaces. So if you take that example, now using all the same factors, go down here, now we have a one millimeter ring and it's always nice when it happens to work out one millimeters, 39 thousandths, which is exactly half of 78 thousandths. So that works out pretty good. So in this case, to get the same, what seals the ring, okay, I kind of missed that point, seals the ring is the surface tension between the ring and the cylinder wall, and that's PSI, okay? So we have 10.2 PSI. That's why I calculated PSI. So if you go down in this case, we still want 10.2 PSI, but because the ring is thinner, okay, contact area now is 0.79, or sorry, 0.39 times 4 times pi is 0.49 square inches, 0.49 square inches, <clears throat> and the force is 5 pounds, so 5 divided by 0.49 gives what? It's 10.2 PSI. So we've achieved the same... Uh, uh, pressure between the piston ring, which is what seals the ring uh, against the cylinder wall, with a thin ring back here with only 5 pounds of force, whereas with the thicker ring it takes 10 pounds of force. Keep that thought. So let's go back to the other page. So the 5 pounds of force is the normal force. Okay. So if you go back down here, I had 100 pounds of force, the coefficient of friction times, times the coefficient of friction. So now, instead of uh, where we had 10 pounds before, we only need 5 pounds. So now the friction force, uh, sliding friction between that piston uh, ring and the cylinder wall is half as much as it was before. Well, I hope I got that all right. So... <laughs> so. I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, once again, I don't have an opinion on who's right or who's wrong. I just follow, I look it up in the book and find the facts and I apply the, the, the physics and the science and that's what that is. That's not disputable. Uh, reducing the contact surface area between the cylinder wall and the piston is not going to reduce friction. What it is going to do if you go back to my previous example, if you have back here, that's where you're starting with a wide contact surface, 25 PSI, which is pounds per square inch, 100 pounds down divided by 4 square inches, that's 25 PSI. Now you go to a thinner contact, you know, you have 2 square inches, same force down, now you have 50 PSI. So when you go to a thinner ring, you increase the PSI of contact between the two surfaces. Or when you go to a neural piston, if let's assume you reduce the contact surface area by 50%, you increase the PSI, surface pressure between the two, uh, by exactly the same amount. If I'm, by doubling it, okay, you will double it. So when you have a higher PSI, it's going to wear out sooner. So if you neural your piston, it's going to have a shorter life than if you don't notwithstanding all the other factors. So, I hope that makes sense um, and explains. It, give me a, it, it actually gave me an opportunity to address 
thinner piston rings because thinner piston rings do work. They work because they're thinner, they require less force and is to create the same tension between the two surfaces and for that reason thinner rings uh, do reduce uh, uh, friction and free up horsepower and so really the proper term for a thinner ring is uh, low tension ring. It's the low tension factor that helps to, uh, helps to reduce the friction. Hope you found that helpful and before I forget, please like and subscribe. And uh, we're on our way to Tom's and we'll be uh, talking about that when we get to Tom's. And then uh, this is a Tuesday on Saturday. We will be at the dyno with this engine. Let's see what it does. Thank you for watching Gold Scratch.